linguistic stereotypes. The British see American English as substandard, while Americans look on the British English as cold. Italian is expressive, Chinese is succinct, French is the language of love, German the language of technology, Spanish is passionate, Japanese calculated. Linguistic stereotypes, the conflation of culture and language. I'm Brian Altano, professor of English and foreign languages, and your host for this second in a series of five community forums sponsored by the National Council on Foreign Languages and the Bergen Community College Center for International Studies. This program is entitled Language and Culture, a Sociological Approach. And I'd like to welcome my guests, Theo Solomon, Professor of Sociology and Criminology, and Charles Zisa, Professor of English. Welcome to Community Forum. Thank you. Thank you. Now let's begin with politics. In this century, in this century we've passed from the live mass demonstration, the great orators, uh, William Jennings Bryan, uh, the dictators of the 1920s and 30s in Europe. Uh, from that, we passed to the radio and the comforting voice of Franklin Delano Roosevelt, for example, in the fireside chats. More recently, we've moved on to television. Perhaps less and less the linguistic, the oral communication is important. Now we have an actor in the White House. Do you see this? Do you see the spoken word as less and less important in politics? Yeah. Well, I think what we're getting now, instead of the spoken word, is we're getting a package. I think Marshall McLuhan is very, very right in saying that the medium is the message, and television is a very hot medium, which allows people to come into your home very, very quickly and establish a rapport. And that rapport is a total rapport, not a rapport of one dimension. Unfortunately, that dimension seems to be very gerrymandered and very put together by a bunch of other people other than the person themselves. Chuck? Um, I really think that uh, the, uh, the problem, or the change, re is reflected in that uh, the previous media, which you mentioned, William Jennings Bryan on the platform, or uh, uh, even with the radio, there is a, a, a separation which is no longer there. When, tele when you have television, it is having someone coming right into your home, being accepted as a guest. Now, uh, the reaction that you have to that person is quite different. Uh, in this, though, you, you, you have a question there, which is, has the importance of the spoken word changed? Mm -hmm. And I don't think it has. I think that what, what we have is a different aspect of it. Different delivery. Different delivery, yes. Would Roosevelt have been, have been s successful on television? He was very successful on his medium. I think in America he would be extremely successful because we have a very strange dichotomy here in a democracy. Very often we would like someone of royalty or aristocracy. I think we were trying to get a touch of that with Kennedy the first and Kennedy the second, and we certainly had it with Roosevelt four times, so that there is a certain feeling of a certain presence, and that presence was a presence of president, and I think that's very important for us. Reagan is a terribly successful television president. Would he have been as successful in the year of the mass demonstration? Can these qualities be transferred? I think a, uh, a person is a product of his times. It sounds like a <laughs> cliche, <laughs> but uh, it's very hard to say whether someone at this time in a Reagan is, is has been raised, trained, and developed as a person who is on a screen. Mm -hmm. And this is, you know, television is a natural for him in that way. Uh, I don't think that uh, a previous person, going back to Brian, I don't think that the, uh, Brian would have been as effective uh, simply because he was not, he had not gone through that development. Now, of course, if he had been born now, he would have undergone an entirely mm -hmm. different 
background. Yet it, it's hard analyze, to say. When we analyze the newsreels of the 1930s and the mass demonstrations, demonstrations mm -hmm. of Hitler and Mussolini, they almost look ludicrous. Why is that? Well, I think first, when you speak to between 12,000 and 150,000 people in an area, you have to communicate to them, and you have to communicate to them as we do in the largest theaters, and that is with gross gesture. Mm -hmm. I think that they would have tailored their material to the very sophisticated and very subtle eye blink and turn a voice that we would have in a television camera in your room. But there's another thing, if I may bring up a different mm -hmm. dimension, mm -hmm. especially with these charismatic leaders. They were speaking to a specific group of wanting people. And I think that their message was so hot that no matter how they put it across, it was the material that was most important. I don't believe that we have that same kind of material today. I don't think we have the, the same problems, the same level of problems. I mean, think of the, th the things that were coming in the 30s. And the video control box gives you a tremendous amount of control. The minute the speech or the political message uh, becomes unpalatable, you simply change the channel and you get Vanna White and the Wheel of Fortune. So that now the president is competing. <laughs> I'm sorry, the president is competing with these other images mm -hmm. on television. Recently in France, the government and the press have launched campaigns to eliminate English words from everyday language. Mussolini did the same thing in the 1930s in Italian. Is language such a representation of natural culture that we feel the urge to purge it and cleanse it every once in a while? If you have that image of language to begin with, I don't think this would work with uh, the English-speaking world. English throughout its history has been a language which has accepted words from all over. And uh, we have a diverse vocabulary. I don't think that uh, any English speaker has any sense of the purity of English as Anglo-Saxon or uh, in its Germanic sense. Uh, other languages have a different feeling for their, or other peoples have a different feeling for their language. Uh, the French regard French as something special and pure. But we are defensive here. If you look at the California ruling or the one language ruling which is just about to be passed in the state of New Jersey, we are defensive of English and not uh, so much accepting foreign languages. I think one of the equations that is made in that it's uh, implicit in your question is that a language is indicative of a total culture. And in areas where there is a duality of culture or a fight for culture, language means more than the words itself. It means the operationalization of that language. Mm -hmm. In, Fran in uh, uh, Canada, the dual languages, in the Alto Adice or the Tyrol, it's according even where, which name you use, title you use. Uh, in Trieste, my mother-in-law still speaks of all places in Yugoslavia by their Italian names and refuses to switch even, as though by magic it will return back to Italian hand. South Africa and Afrikaans versus English or Dutch means the use of my language is the use of my culture. And that's a very important issue rather than the words themselves. Yes, I mean, there are two points here. One is whether the language will accept borrowings, which is one thing. Mm -hmm and the use of the totality of the language, which is something else. Mm. Well, let's discuss the United States, for example. We have a stereotyped image around the world as being terrible in language. Are, are Americans as bad linguistically as many would indicate? I would say that one of the problems is who you look at. Uh, is the, um, when you uh, talk to people on the street, the people that we ordinarily see, uh, they have no, no reason to learn a foreign language. There is no pressure here mm -hmm. to learn foreign languages. We do not have a population of native speakers of another language within 100 miles of us. Uh, or a thousand. One, or a th <laughs> well, I mean, there's, there is Quebec. <laughs> um, but um, we, do, uh, we don't have the feeling that if we go into another area within a uh, a short distance from us, that we have to be able to function in a different language. We don't have that pressure. Um, the other thing is that the people that we meet abroad are the people who deal with us. Therefore, they have to learn.
for our language anyway. The travel people, yeah. tourists. Yeah. Now, uh, does the European coming over here encounter the same type of travel person? Mm -hmm. Does he know the language of these travelers? Uh, as a whole, my experience has been that Americans do not learn languages well. Um, Is this something sociological or inherent in the American psyche? Well, may I just bring up a point first before sure. discussing that? I speak six languages. I think you, we all speak about the same. To speak to any person in America, they think you are a genius. In any other culture, if you didn't speak four, you would be an idiot. Americans believe there is an equation between learning a language and intelligence. And we make a lot of it because very few of us do. Those of us who came here, and most people who came to this country, were of lower class origin who spoke languages of necessity. Mm -hmm. And that is, you spoke the language of the conqueror, certainly, and you spoke the language of your ethnicity. When one came here, there was not that great need except to learn English, which mm -hmm. that generation rarely did, but the next generation totally did. Sure. And so once that language came into be American and the need and drive to be enculturated, there was also implicit do not go or revert back to other languages, lose yourself in the melting pot and become American. Mm -hmm. So that we had this idea of a language as an American language without other languages which had a negative connotation. Well, my idea of uh, learning languages, especially for children, is we've always said children learn languages much more readily. And my idea is that this is a myth perpetuated by adults uh, who do not wish to learn the language and who feel inadequate. Uh, certainly in the American schools, we have never stressed language instructions, uh, instruction at an early level. In many European countries, before you finish grammar school, you must speak English and pass a proficiency exam, an oral proficiency exam. We've never had that here. We, we have, for example, television French, where we watch 25 minutes a week, or we have the German instructor, who also teaches at seven other grammar schools. But we've never had uh, an indoctrinated effort at foreign languages. Uh, do you believe this about children and languages? Do children learn better? I think they do, because language is first and foremost a habit. And an adult has difficulty in getting rid of habits, uh, lifetime habits. Any of us who have smoked have <laughs> learned that. Mm -hmm. um, now, when you learn a new language, you've got to develop a new habit. Uh, a child is not ingrained in his language. Uh, he is close enough to the period of learning that he can develop a new, uh, a new habit without any great effort, or the second habit of the second language. Uh, however, I think studies have shown that children do not retain a language. Uh, if you take them out of the environment where they are required to use that language, they will rapidly forget it, mm -hmm. uh, the second language this is. Yeah. Uh, to paraphrase Frederick March, when uh, I think it was Marlon Brando asked, what is my motivation? Uh, Frederick March said, money. I think motivation for language is very important, and one of the best motivations is that you can make money using it. I have come across many, many children throughout the world who speak English and French and German and every other tourist language in places where only Hindi is spoken because they can make money with it. I have met people in every marketplace in the world from every age, including 85 and 90-year-old men and women who speak five, six, and seven languages, not only who speak those languages, but are clever enough to look at you, look at your shoes and your haircut, and tell you, and speak your language before you do. Mm -hmm. That I think that only under certain conditions, in other words, if you come to a country and speak a language before the age of 12, you can lose an accent of a language, but I don't think there's a great uh, advantage one way or the other it was at, in terms of age in terms of motivation. I don't believe we have the motivation to learn. And as uh, mm -hmm. I think, as you said before, part of it is that the people are just so far away. So Put, much wait, of, May I just yes. say one last thing? And that is, the motivation that I saw in Perugia, which you may remember, is every female learned the language immediately upon getting an Italian boyfriend. Mm -hmm. Motivation. <laughs> so much of communication, in addition to being oral, is also in terms of hand gestures, reading subtle signs of a culture in order to aid communication. Uh, how many times we've tried with the little guidebooks to get our word across, where's the store, 
Where's the taxi stand? Using any possible hand gesture uh, in our power. Now, an adult can obviously read this better than a child. Uh, are there certain hand gestures? Are some languages more expressive than others? We talked about stereotypes. Italian, Italians speak more expressive, expressively with their hands. The British don't. Uh, when John F. Kennedy uh, spoke to the Russians, uh, he would always stare directly at the sp person who was speaking, the Russian, and not at the interpreter, as other uh, politicians sometimes do. Yeah. Uh, why, why is this? Can, could he read something? I wonder in that, could it be that he was showing interest in the speaker? In other words, this was a calculated effort mm -hmm. or uh, a calculated exercise in showing the speaker that he was really interested in what he was saying. Mm -hmm. This would had have nothing made. to do with the <laughs> gestures at all. <laughs> However, I remember in the picture Failsafe with Henry Fonda as the president, mm -hmm. He asked the fellow who is J.R. now, whose name I cannot remember, not only tell me what he says, tell me the intensity, tell me the meaning, tell me the urgency, so that even over the telephone, he was trying to get other images other than the voice itself. The visual I think, image. yes, I think it is very important to get as much of the message as is being given. And certain times you're getting even, and why we have the term mixed messages, Mm -hmm. while you may be getting two different messages, one oral message and one a, a non-oral message. The Foreign Service Institute, in their language program, also stresses reading gestures, reading body language. Uh, can sometimes we get deceived by body language? Can we perhaps be... Misreading it? Uh, we, can be, we can misread body language, yes. Uh, however, uh, I think body language... Now, here we have to distinguish between two things. One is body language, by which we mean posturing and uh, expressions, which are generally universal to the human being, as opposed to hand gestures, which mm -hmm. are vary according to language or culture. Uh, I think that we see more of the person through his posture, through his expression, than we do uh, through hearing his voice. Certainly, you know, if you learn a foreign language, speaking on the telephone, is about the last skill that you master. Much more difficult. It's very difficult. They have uh, done some studies of taking, of taping conversations at parties, or the uh, conversation at parties. And when you play it back, it becomes meaningless. You don't know. Taking it out of the context. Taking it completely mm -hmm. out of context. Uh, you need that extra reinforcement. Uh, and certainly, if you're dealing in, at the level of a president, you should have that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think certain languages just add a certain richness with gesture. Uh, I don't know whether it is important that it adds extra to the understanding, but I think it allows a person to show his personality or show a language's personality, and languages do have mm -hmm. a personality, and is an enrichment, and I think is rather important. It adds a specific dimension that others do not add, and certainly in, in terms of comprehension is, is rather important. Are Americans expressive? Are the English? Is English an expressive language? If you know what to look for. Expressive <laughs> visually, verbally, and visually. in gestures? Uh, visually more than anything else. It's probably one of the least expressive languages, but I believe that's for a reason that is probably rather uh, left-fielded. But I believe that the uh, British, from the time they decided to become a colonial power, devised a system of lack of communication, f verbal, facial communication, mm -hmm. so that they could rule, and that it is easier to rule people without them understanding on a diplomatic level what you mean and what you wish to say. Their total culture is one of non-emotional involvement from the time that one uh, sends a child to public school to the time one goes overseas for their first colonial experience. And I'm not talking, of course, now, but for sure. a good period of their history so that they were able to administer and administer unemotionally. And I think that has crept up into the rest of the language while we put someone else of a romance language or a different kind of language. And we find it very, very, and just uh, listen to French Canadian people speaking English. Sure. And all of a sudden, all of the richness comes back with the use of, mm -hmm. of the hands. Uh, I have it, which came first, chicken or the egg question here. <laughs> Did the British develop this as a technique of empire, or is it something that they had before? Uh, 
we had the Latin, you know, the Roman Empire. Romans were never known for being cold, unemotional types. Sure. And that this yeah. was a, an offshoot of Latin. No, uh, no, no, as, as, as a colonial power. Mm -hmm. I, think, uh, I think it's a very interesting thing that you should mention that, since the colonial style of the British and the colonial style of all who took the Roman, the Pax Romana, the French, for example, are completely different colonial styles. Mm -hmm. The French style is to get into a country and make a little France and make everyone French and make everyone part of the same culture, and the British are exactly the opposite. You, you start a new Britain and, and exclude all other people. And they're very, very different. And the Latins are, mm -hmm. in themselves, very, very emotional and very demonstrative. And I think it does, it, it shows a, a great parallel between the two different styles of colonialism. Latin was a universal language in the Middle Ages and the Renaissance. If you were a professor at Oxford, you could move on to a semester in Paris and a semester in Bologna, and a wonderful flexibility and mobility that language gave you. Uh, they have tried, or they are continually trying, Esperanto as a universal language. Is this thing possible? Is a universal, uh, universal language possible? My opinion on this is as soon as you have a universal language, it will split into separate languages again. Uh, Latin was, for the Roman Empire, a universal language. There are now, what, six major Latin languages and several lesser. Uh, Arabic was, a, was and is a uh, universal language for Islam. It has already split into at least three languages. Mm -hmm. uh, a language, for some reason, I don't think anybody really knows why, languages constantly develop, and they will develop into dial or different sections. D uh, different communities of speakers will develop into different dialects, and if the separateness is maintained, uh, there is, they will develop into different languages. We do have one new thing on the scene, which is our instant communication system. Uh, English, I understand, I have read, was in danger of splitting into two languages in the United States and Brink Britain. At least they were diverging. Mm -hmm. They're no longer diverging. They are coming back together. There is becoming a universal sort of English between Britain and the United States. And not only between Britain and the United States, perhaps amongst all the other uh, countries in the world. Is I'm English not, not sure the Esperanto though. now? Yes, it is. Yes. I think in whether Esperanto <coughs> or any, I think there have been about 13 or 14 major attempts in the last 200 at years unifying. at unifying languages. One of the problems continually is a problem of emphasis. One is based in generally a Western language, or most are based in Western languages, mm -hmm. and therefore Eastern languages or Eastern peoples do not have the identification with them. And I think it then becomes a matter of nationalism, which even more, if the language is used, will split up for other reasons other than the use of the language and the need for that language. And therefore, periodically, we have had those languages that are the language of culture, quotation marks, the language mm -hmm. of strength, the language of diplomacy. We have many lingua francas. Now, strangely, I don't mean to sound like Yogi Berra, but the, the lingua franca is English. Mm -hmm. Are we satisfied with this? Is this should, be, should this be a source of national pride to Americans? First, I don't think that we travel enough to understand its, its benefits. Mm -hmm. In business, certainly, mm -hmm. uh, we recognize its benefits. Yes. Because we don't have to learn German and Japanese um, as we used and to. other languages, as we used to. Yes. And Yes. I was just going to say, I don't think Americans appreciate English enough. It's a remarkable instrument. And, uh, and given short shrift. Yeah. yeah. Since we continue, first we continue really for the many, many years, the lingua franca being French, mm -hmm. the strategy was always, or the stereotypy was always that it was the language of diplomacy because it was so rich. I think English is much richer as a language, much more precise mm -hmm. as a language. In terms of vocabulary, In terms words, of vocabulary we have and, far more than any other language. Yes. And so that we were able to think that French was, because for the same reason as the Russians thought French was and imported French there, uh, we didn't really have an appreciation of our own language. And I think that uh, we still do not have that. Though over, I think, other than Chinese, English is the language that is spoken most in the world now of any other language. We don't have the sense of, our, of the power of our own language, and yet we don't uh, flock to learn foreign languages. Where would you classify the American? In the middle of two linguistic systems? 
You have to have a language, so why should it be English? <laughs> so there's no conscious decision no. on this part. And there's been no advantage or disadvantage mm -hmm. to have it or not to have it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No. And yet, the language of the conqueror uh, was always the language that was forced upon you. Uh, at, since, sec since the Second World War, we have... Uh, there we have been have times when that is not the case. Very few, would, but there have been times. That would be resistance, then, and, and on, on a sense of linguistic and political resistance. And we have been the cultural dominators, or we've thought to be that, and we have certainly tried to be that uh, around the world. So this must be ingratiating to, to us, not only uh, as a business source, but also as a cultural source. Should we fight back against the French who want to uh, purge the French language uh, of English words? I think any time a culture or a country thinks that it must purge itself, it generally has a problem internally, not externally. I think Mustafa Kemal did the same thing in 1922 in Turkey, removing the Arabic symbols, in other words, not using the Arabic script anymore, but going to a different script, took out as many Arabic words as possible, as many Persian words as possible, because one has the feeling, again, that you have a neo-nationalistic feeling. Now this is called, in America, perhaps, coca colonialism. <laughs> I'd like to thank you for being on Community Forum today and tell you that on next week's show we'll discuss uh, the new immigration law and the aspects and endeavors of the Hispanic Institute of Bergen Community College uh, in adapting uh, these policies, these government policies, and making them more explicit to the Hispanic community. Next week we will also speak with Joseph Murphy of the Bergen Language Institute about children and learning language, an issue we discussed in brief today. We will also uh, have an innovative program uh, about language learning and children. Thank you for being on Community Forum. Thank you. Thank you.